I'm Andrew Patterson from interest.co.nz. Welcome to another in our business success series. Uh, with me today, the Chief Executive of Urbano Healthcare, Alan Clark. Hello, Alan. Hello, Andrew. Good to see you. So, Alan, you, you operate in, in four sectors, audiology, uh, rehabilitation, diagnostic, dental, but, it, but it's really dental that's been the growth driver behind Urbano, isn't it? Yeah, look, absolutely. And I think... Um, we've been in dental now for probably the best part of 10 years, uh, but it's really in the last two to three years that it's become very, very visible. We had a big audiology presence before. Uh, we sold the majority of uh, our audiology investment, which was the New Zealand company. Um, we've got a residual in Australia, but dental is absolutely the lion's share now with uh, two streams, one in New Zealand, Lumino the dentists, and one in Australia, Dental Partners. Similar model both at different stages of evolution. Just explain that, that model. Is it So you, do you own these practices outright or, or are they, they franchised? Sure. Um, the model we have is 100% ownership. So we actually go to a dentist and we acquire the business of that he's established from him. He continues with us as effectively a contractor because they work on commission. So he will continue working in his practice. We look after the back office, the corporate side, the marketing side, uh, the logistics, the HR, and add value through that sort of back office synergy, provide locum support for him. Um, but I think in New Zealand, people will be very familiar with the Lumino ads on television, which is sort of a first for us. And you can then get the synergy of a large, large group, which as an individual, you just can't, can't get at. Um, the dynamics within the dental market are astounding. Um, we spend $650 million a year going to the dentist in New Zealand. Australians spend $7,500 million a year going to the dentist. So it's an $8 billion trans-Tasman market. Private payment or insurance payment, very little government intervention. Uh, 14,000 registered dentists and when we started 10 years ago, the biggest group was about four clinics. Mm. Everyone else was sole traders in that environment. So as a consolidator going into that environment, the opportunity to keep growing and putting groups together is profound and look after, um, in terms of Australasia with Dental Corp, Pacific Smiles, Run 300, all of us have been going about five years, hammer and tong growing. Collectively, we're under 15% of the available market. So we can keep growing at this rate, you know, for decades. And, and obviously you're getting the synergy, the buying synergies of, of, of that collective bulk buying. Yeah, look, absolutely. And as I've, we've just been talking about, I'm off to New York to go and talk to the big material suppliers to the group. So we basically buy more of anything a dentist uses than anybody else in Australasia. So on the basis of that, there is a real synergy opportunity to go to the suppliers and to say, look, um, let's try and get the best quality we can, but also the best pricing that we can. And if we can create genuine partnerships with these people, they can access business opportunities that, you know, otherwise they couldn't op uh, uh, get there. But, um, you know, if we can shave sort of three, four, percent of our materials bill, 4% on a couple of hundred million dollars is a big number and that's just straight pre-tax. Of course as we all know when we hand over the credit card uh, after a, a dental visit uh, there is substantially more margin than, than when you go to the GP. Absolutely and look I don't apologise for that at all. Um, we it's interesting that you know we quite happily sit at home and we'd get a plumber in to fix our sink and part with two, three hundred dollars for the travelling time in and out. But you're going to get someone going into your mouth with, you know, scalpels and uh, injections and anaesthetics and drilling, altering your appearance. Um, and I constantly say to our professionals, understand that you know what you do is highly skilled and highly valued, and don't ever underestimate you know that your skill mm -hmm. is translated into real value. 
Um, but it is an issue, though, isn't it? You know, this affordability issue. But a lot of people choose not to go to the dentist, yep. you know, because because they can't afford it, basically. Yep. So, it, it, is that both a hindrance and an opportunity for you in the future? Look, very much so. And part of the um, uh, New Zealanders will be familiar with the Lumino ad. And part of that uh, byline was actually a recognition of the economic environment we're in. And we went out with an 18 months interest free offer. On top of that, we've just gone out with a 24 months interest free offer. Now, that is a direct recognition that in the environment that we're in, times are tough. Um, that has been enormously successful uh, in terms of throughput. We use a thing called QCard. Um, the cost of QCard to us is the same as a credit card transaction, but what it does is allow our customers to access a period where they can arrange for a drip payment. We don't carry the risk, it's a factoring opportunity. And we do recognise you know, that that is a, a function of the economic environment that we're in. We also do a series of pro bono things. We have an initiative with Kids Can at the moment where we are the New Zealand backer and sponsor for Kids Can. So we recognise that there's kids out there who can't access dental care, that oral health is a big issue. And we open our clinics free for weekends at a time so that we can get these kids through, get good oral health going. Um, but you're right, there's a social responsibility. But on the other side, uh, I make no apology that you know the skill of the dentist is uh, not, not a commodity that can be put out there at the lowest price. Do you absorb that effective interest cost as a, as a cost of sale? Yes, absolutely, because um, the financing cost, as I said, is approximately the same as a credit card transaction. So we're quite happy to offer that payment scheme. Because it's Q card. they are not just a finance company that are sort of, you know, banging out a, um, a, a, a cheap product. What they're actually doing is carefully vetting the applicants that come in to make sure that they are not overextending themselves because the last thing we want is a bunch of our clients who default on bills. So the partnership with QCard has been very valuable to us. It's been suggested that you, you need to acquire a dentistry practice every 10 days to maintain your rate of growth. Is, is, that, is that metric correct and, and, and how, do you, how do you actually go about achieving that? Yeah, sure. Look, it, it's probably a function, you know, it's like stats. It's sort of saying how many practices have you bought divided by how many days, what's the outcome? And that pace of once every 10 days or two weeks is approximately the, the pace of acquisition that we've had over the last two years. Now, um, it's not a matter of maintaining that pace for growth. It's saying we've got this enormously fragmented marketplace. The opportunity to pull groups together is very real and that an acquisition pace of that is one that we're comfortable with. So bearing in mind we've got you know about 1,300 people in the dentist group on both sides of the Tasman, we look very carefully at making sure that the acquisition pace is going to be matched by the operational discharge mm. so that we can not just buy them. It's not a buffalo hunt where you want to drop them. You know, you want to actually buy them, bring them in, make sure the cultural fit is working well, make sure they're introduced, that your operational support can cope with it. And we figured that that pace is a comfortable pace for us. The, the other side of the Tasman is really going to though offer greater opportunities for you in the future than, than perhaps New Zealand. Yeah, sure. Look, the reality is, you know, we are a small country. Um, uh, in a lot of cases, we're the branch office to Australian headquarters, you know, the banks are prime examples of that. Um, and that's a bit sad because I think the reality is that New Zealand does punch well above its weight. We've been talking about some iconic companies that are doing some amazing things internationally and we need to get rid of that chip on our shoulder. We can be the international player. Um, but the reality is the market, just the sheer numbers uh, in Australia, um, mean that the opportunity for growth internationally is going to be outside of New Zealand. It's not a bad thing. Um, it's a great opportunity for our shareholders, but it's just a function of size. You've got more competition though in Australia, a, a major competitor doing effectively what, what you're doing, and is this going to be effect, end up becoming a fight for market share? 
Yeah, not really. Um, the reality of the fight for market share dynamic is that, as I said before, you know, the size of that trans Tasman market is eight billion dollars, eight thousand million dollars. Um, so at two hundred and fifty million, you know, we're lost in the rounding error in terms of market share. So we can keep growing at the pace that we're growing for a long time. Um, before there's going to be any issue of you know any kind of um, size restriction or opportunity restriction, with a number of corporates into the market, the, the biggest uh, concern that we had when we started into this was not so much a competitive corporate, but the profession has always been very isolationist. You know, they but we we are dentists, and you're a corporate, and you're about sort of a bunch of values that perhaps aren't aligned with us. So we're more worried that, um, for want of a better expression, there's ratbag corporate that comes in, who is a tiller the hun, who sort of clouds the, uh, the marketplace with bad behaviour. Um, having a good corporate competitor out there just means that there's choice. In a lot of cases, Dental Corporation is our major competitor. It's owned by Booper, who's an insurance company. Um, and a lot of the dentists that come to us say we don't want to be in line with an insurance company because an insurance company will dictate how we can practice dentistry. And we say we're not aligned to anybody. We can have insurance clients that uh, come in and out, but you know we're not going to dictate um, your dental practice, your clinical practice. We, we know there's this disparity too about you know fee structures. Uh, dentists can earn a lot more in, in Australia than here. So is the ability to retain talent in, in New Zealand equally a challenge for you? I, look, absolutely. Um, that is probably, that statement would apply to any area of uh, the health profession. The reality is you can probably earn 20 to 25 percent more uh, at face value going to Australia, in some cases a lot more than that. Um, the thing that's lost though is that Australia is a very high tax environment and uh, that marginal extra tax cost almost negates it, it's almost line ball but you have that conversation with a prospective employee and they stop listening to you. Um, so the reality is though we have to be very careful in New Zealand because we are competing with a fantastic market. The sun shines, it's warm, there's great infrastructure, it's a wonderful lifestyle. You know, it's not as if we're competing with a place that is sort of difficult socially to live. And so that tension is always there. And I'm always very wary of people say, I'll come to New Zealand for lifestyle. You know, so what that basically means is I don't want to work as hard, I want to earn as much, and I want to goof off a bit. And the reality is, well, no, you can't come here for lifestyle. You can come here because it's a great society to bring your kids up in and to live in, and it's competitive. And we need to create the structures and the environment so that they get the opportunities that they would get in an Australian uh, job to come here. But, yep, that tension is always there. We've spoken a fair bit about the dentistry side, it's 70% of your business, but the other 30% is made up in some of those other areas we, we spoke about at the start, you know, audiology, uh, rehabilitation services, um, diagnostic. Yeah. Uh, where, where's the growth potential for them in the future? Sure. The majority of those other businesses, um, audiology, we have a residual business uh, once we sold out of New Zealand into Australia. So we have a chain called Bay Audio in Australia and we have a chain into Southeast Asia of Bay Audio. That's in an early development stage. We're opening up in retail shopping malls. So we have been working for the last three, four years to get that uh, into the right shape. And it's approaching the period now. In the next couple of years, it'll get to break even and start to kick. Uh, it's a model we're familiar with. We have a joint venture with our long-standing partner, in Bay New Zealand and that, so that business has been great. The other growth business is radiology in New Zealand. We understand radiology very well, so we have Ascot and Insight Radiology. We've recently opened in the Millennium Centre in the North Shore in Auckland uh, with um, a called Modality, so these are the big machines like MRIs, CTs, CAT scans, PET CT, which is a specific kind of uh, machine used in the diagnosis of cancers and radiology we think has got some real legs and some real opportunities. We have a pathology business in Wellington so that's blood tests. Uh, that business is very reliant on DHB contracts so 
Um, we've said that's a hold and maintain because we don't want to increase our exposure to something where basically you bet the business every three years. We're very hopeful um, and government is certainly indicating this and DHBs are indicating that they won't continue this Darwinian tender process and uh, so there's some real opportunities there. And then our rehab business is orthotics uh, in Auckland, small business in each player, uh, really interesting little company and actually that business has got some opportunities coming up where we think um, there can be some diversification um, because it also has a reliance on DHB tendering. So the big sort of growth area outside of dentistry is really going to be radiology in New Zealand and then ultimately um, audiology into Australia, uh, which is going to continue to grow quite strongly. When you look at Urbano over the last 10 years, you've done an awful lot of buying and selling of businesses. In fact, you, you've almost been a, a sort of a quasi PE, a private equity sort of uh, company taking stakes and then obviously when they reach maturity exiting. Has that been a, a part of the your, your key philosophy as well too yeah. for the company? Yeah, I'm not sure I like the, the PE analogy because quite honestly, um, I sell off PE firms. Um, especially when you're, you're buying into a business, um, we're an investor operator. So we create symbiotic partnerships with the clinicians that are there. And when we do invest with them, we say we're a generational investor with you. If we want this gig to last 100 years and you want it to, it'll last that time. But where we have come across businesses that for a number of reasons have either reached a maturity or the funding dynamics have changed. We have then sat with our partners to say, what do you want to do? Do we want to continue here or should we recognise that there's change? So just addressing those three sectors, we started out life as elder care um, and we were a retirement village operator. So we had nursing homes and very small retirement villages. Uh, the government of the day removed asset testing now what that meant was you and I are going to get free rest home care, but what it meant as an operator, I can't control my price. Price is controlled by government. And so we looked at that and said we've got to get out. So in 2003 we started the process and we sold out uh, to Macquarie because we basically said from an investor shareholder point of view, not being able to control your price is really dangerous. You've got low paid wages, margin squeeze and government ain't going to give you any more money. In Audiology's case we had a long-standing partnership with uh, Peter Hudson. We grew that business to the point where it was really reaching maturity in New Zealand. We couldn't grow. We seeded operations into Australia and into Southeast Asia. Uh, we had some hostile takeovers on the company from uh, Crescent Capital and they were after the Audiology business because they owned a business in Australia in Audiology. And finally they came in and they just made us a fantastic offer. So we sat again with our partner Peter and said, what do you want to do? And Pete said, look, I would like to go to Australia and continue with that business. New Zealand's at a mature cycle and I'm happy to uh, exit. And we said, good, because the audiology group was going to join a big established Australian group. And in fact, 12 months later, that whole group was sold to Amplathon, which is the world's largest uh, retailer of audiology products. So we delivered our clinicians into an environment that we just couldn't offer. We couldn't offer the same scope. Those things are really quite important because if you get into a deal or you exit from a transaction, uh, the best analogy I've heard is there mustn't be a ripple on the pond. Mm -hmm. Your, your reputation is absolutely, our reputation is absolutely critical. So it's not just that sector, but how the investors view it, how all clinicians view us as a potential partner. So the audiology was a maturity thing, elder care was a government funding thing. Brain injury rehabilitation had really reached a point where it was completely reliant on ACC funding. We couldn't add any more value because we weren't willing to take on more government risk. And Bupa came along, the big insurer. And they said, hey, we understand the government contracting sector and we'd be happy to take it on. And we knew that that was going into a very safe pair of hands. Who would add value that we couldn't add value? So 
Yes, selectively we do exit businesses, um, but we're not a PE firm. When I talk to PE, uh, to, to healthcare people selling to us, and there's always a PE presence running around, I say, look, if you want the biggest dollar, sell to the PE guys, but understand they're gonna put pink lipstick on you, bang you in a tutu, and sell you in two years time, okay? And we're not there, we're there to be your partner. Uh, and we'll be there as long as you want to do. But that's a PE mandate. When you look at the success of uh, Ryman, uh, yep. you, do, do you sometimes regret getting out of that um, retirement village uh, property area? Oh, look, Ryman's been a stunning success story. In fact, it's jumped in the last couple of days again. Um, and interestingly, John Ryder uh, you know, got out of that long time ago and he has left a great deal of value on, on the table for new investors. Um, no, I don't because the reality was that Ryman had a critical mass and a model that as elder care we didn't have. We had more nursing homes, Ryman was pure retirement villages. Cliff Cook is a, a guy I've known for years and I speak with often and Cliff was the founder of MetLife. And you know, again, Cliff had, was very clear that MetLife was a property development uh, exercise. Um, and Met and Ryman did stuff that I think was beyond Urbano's, that stage, Elder Care's balance sheet at the time, and we just didn't have uh, the expertise to go into it. Now, there's been some other entries like Somerset and so on who've done very well, and that's great. But I think the areas we went into have generated equal value for our shareholders. So thinking towards the future, where the, the growth will come in, in dentistry and clearly in Australia, and obviously you're operating a fair bit in, in Asia as well too. So is, is that your plan, more global expansion in the future? Selective, uh, so it's not a sort of an eclectic take over the world attitude. We, we need to be very careful that we invest in stuff we understand really well, that it's a partnership, uh, with the clinicians, uh, we've just been talking about Warren Buffett. But you know, in the words of Warren Buffett, one of the questions I remember was asked of Warren was, "So, um, when you buy a business, do you change it?" And you know, Warren said, "Why would I change it? I bought it because it's a success. I will sit at its board and I will challenge it, and I will allow it to realise its potential. But I'm not going to change it." And I think that that's where that corporate ego can get in the way, especially in what we do, because it's such a diversified patch. Simply that you take over the equity doesn't mean you're smarter, it just means you've got more money, okay? And the issue is to recognise where the smarts are. So we partner with the clinicians that are there, we add value, sometimes in a business sense, structural sense, strategic sense, balance sheet sense to them. Perhaps we can put in some operating disciplines that they may not be familiar with. Um, but fundamentally, the strategy remains with them. So those opportunities will be there for us. And, and since updating the market a month ago, the market's kind of sold you down a bit, to down about share prices off about 17% just in the last month. Has that, has yep. that surprised you? Looking at um, where the market had taken us up to uh, $6.70 odd, we were operating on a um, a, a rear looking PE of about 45 times. And the reality of that is that what my rationale for it, never try and explain the share price, the market sets the share price. But we've been very careful over the years about talking to shareholders, investors. We're very open. Um, we explain our strategy. And if you get the confidence of the investor, they will mark you on your forecast, not on what you've done. Uh, we came out with a statement that basically said uh, the economy in Australia was getting pretty ropey and it has done so over the last eight months and we were just saying the forward look is going to be more difficult and we're just cautious about that and on top of that the recession in New Zealand still bubbles along but it's inching up and so what we did was just sort of take I think some of the expectation out I think there was a lot of profit taking that's there but no not concerned um, we were going, uh, the strategy remains the same, the fundamental footprints remain the same, and I think it's the market uh, marking us back on a fundamentals basis uh, to where we sit today. So, no, I'm not concerned.